Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine here in the heart of Westminster. Now, if there's one thing the Conservatives don't need, it's more scandal. And this evening, Daniel Korski has quit the race to be London Mayor after allegations of groping. Meanwhile, the government continues to struggle against high inflation, soaring interest rates and a cost of living crisis that just won't go away. And to make matters worse, the country's biggest water company, supplying a quarter of all UK households, is on the brink of collapse. So plenty for us to get stuck into as we bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. Now, this is how Daniel Korski announced he was pulling out of that race to be the Conservative candidate for London Mayor. Doing so, he said, with a heavy heart. We'll have much more reaction this evening. But meanwhile, at PMQs earlier, the party leaders clashed over, what else? The economy. It's why we've introduced a new mortgage charter, which, by the way, goes much more farther than the Labour Party policy on protecting mortgage holders does. Well, the Prime Minister and Sir Keir Starmer setting the scene for the kind of arguments we are going to hear a lot in the year to come. And the Labour leader used a phrase that I think you might hear a bit more of. A Tory mortgage bombshell because they crashed the economy. Millions left without support because he won't make lenders put families first. Well, we'll certainly be talking about the cost of living crisis this evening and lots more with our guests on the show tonight. We will be joined by the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, the Shadow Environment Secretary, Jim McMahon, an awful lot in his brief, of course, with Thames Water. Plus, we'll talk to the Canadian Defence Minister, Anita Anand, and much more besides too, on The Take. Hello. Well, there's lots going on today, from Thames Water to Daniel Korski to what is in many ways the image of the day, the Just Stop Oil protesters running onto the pitch during the ashes at Lord's. But there's been plenty more going on during the week so far, not least, of course, the COVID inquiry with Matt Hancock giving evidence for the first time. So let's crack straight on and start with the best bits of the week so far. The former Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has given an emotional apology at the inquiry into the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr Hancock's continuing to give evidence this morning. It comes after the wife of one COVID victim broke down in tears outside the inquiry. I was assured that the UK planning was among the best and in some instances the best in the world. The government has begun drawing up contingency plans for the collapse of Thames Water amid growing doubts in Whitehall about the ability of Britain's biggest water company to service its £14 billion debt pile. All this comes amid a growing debate about the merits of a privatised water industry, with many of its critics arguing that some form of mutual or public ownership would deliver more reliable and efficient services to the public. Sources have told Sky News that the Conservative Party will not investigate a sexual assault allegation levelled at the London mayoral hopeful Daniel Korski. A spokesperson for Mr Korski gave us uh, the following statement. It says, in the strongest possible terms, Dan categorically denies any allegation of inappropriate behaviour whatsoever. Daniel Korski has dropped out of the race to become the Conservative candidate in the London mayoral election uh, following a claim that he groped a TV producer in Downing Street. He says the uh, news agenda, essentially these allegations against him, have become a distraction from his campaign. Three people have been arrested after Just Stop Oil protesters invaded the pitch at Lords just moments after the start of the second Ashes Test match between between England and Australia. One of the protesters was carried off the field, you can see there, by England wicketkeeper Johnny Bairstow. How many will have to lose their homes before he'll stand up for the people his party have pushed into economic misery? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, in fact, the vast majority of the mortgage market is now covered by the new mortgage charter that the Chancellor's brought in. At that image of Johnny Bairstow carrying physically the Just Stop oil protester uh, off the pitch. That's one that will stick in everyone's mind, I'm sure. Well, let's get some reaction from the government now, shall we? On the state of Thames Water and much more. A little earlier, I spoke to the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, but typical timing, of course. It was just before we heard that Daniel Korski had dropped out of the race due to the allegations. So do bear that in mind when you watch this interview. Don't worry. 
We will bring you up to date after it. Here is Mel Stride. Just talk us through, what is the latest with Thames Water? Well, I can't really comment, for example, the financial position of a private company, and you wouldn't expect me to. Um, but what I can reassure you and your uh, viewers of is that whatever happens or transpires over the coming weeks and months, uh, the water will continue to flow. Uh, the government and Ofwat have contingency measures for exactly the kind of circumstances that may play out here, yet to be seen, um, and that's basically where we are with it. I mean, one of those is temporary public ownership, right? Um, I mean, some might argue that permanent nationalisation could be the way forward anyway. Well, as I say, I certainly don't want to start speculating on those kind of issues. We've got to really see where th how things develop. But what I can reassure you of is that we absolutely have contingency plans in place for any eventuality. You can see why people might be angry, though, right? Mm. Bills are going up, sewage is going into the sea, mm. and yet water companies paid out £1.4 billion in dividends last year. That's up from £540 million the last year. Well, um, the government working through off what actually has put in uh, to effect uh, new regulations which make sure that when it comes to dividends and indeed bonuses paid within these companies that they relate to things that are not about environmental damage. So I think that's a very important point. And of course we do have a plan, £56 billion worth of investment going forward to make sure that we reduce the sewage uh, outflows. Now, an important point here, Sophie, is if you went back to 2010, less than 10% of those outflows were being monitored. So we didn't actually know what the situation was at that point. I don't, I don't By want the end of this year, it'll be about 100%. I don't, look, we know, so we've got greater transparency and we've got a plan to deal with it as well. Look, look, the sewage into the sea is one aspect of this. The wider point is people will look at the water companies and they'll be thinking, Nash, um, this isn't working. Why don't we nationalise them? You know, they were privatised in 1989. Since then, household bills up 40%. They paid out £66 billion in dividends to shareholders. No wonder that 63% of voters think they should be privatised. Well, as I say, I'm not going to get into whether we should be wholesale, you know, renationalisation. That is not our policy. The important thing that we need to do is to make sure we get the incentives properly al aligned within those companies. And I've just explained how through off what we're doing that, how we also invest the right amount of money going forward to make sure that we get on top of these sewage outflow uh, issues. And that's what we're absolutely determined to do. Are you not, do you not have any concerns then about the way that Thames Water is run? Well, as I say, I, it just wouldn't be right for me to start commenting on a situation in a private company which may or may it's not be in company, various it kinds of... That like, may or may not, an yes, awful and, lot of people, and that's why, right? That, Everyone that's needs water why. coming out of the taps. Ab absolutely, because, uh, absolutely. Surely in you fact, should be commenting on this. In fact, since privatisation, uh, the, 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 the number of occasions on which people have experienced a lack of water coming out of the tap has reduced by over 80%, so a lot of progress has been made. Can we back as I say, the, very concerned. But the, concerned? Well, the important thing... Well, I, I, I'm concerned that there is resilience in terms of delivery within that sector, but I'm equally satisfied that the government and off what have the appropriate contingencies in place, such that whatever may materialise over the coming days, weeks and months, and I'm not going to speculate on that because I don't think it'd be right to do so, that we will be in a position where water still flows out of the taps and everybody gets the supply that they expect uh, and want. OK. Yeah. I guess it perhaps points to a wider concern that people have about the economy. Mm. That times are really, really difficult at the minute. You know, you've got the cost of living going up, you've got mortgage bills spiralling, and there is a suspicion that this is partly, of course not wholly, but partly because firms aren't doing the right thing. And I just want to show you this from the International Monetary Fund. Mm. You know, they're hardly, you know, kind of the woke left grade, but they say mm. that corporate profits now account for nearly half of all euro area inflation, that the red bars that you can see there going up, yeah. corporate profits. What would you say to that? Well, I, I think we take that kind of data, I know the Bank of England does as well, very seriously. So the Chancellor has uh, just this morning, I think, met with the Competition Markets Authority who are looking into, for example, unit pricing across the retail sector, particularly with a focus on food. 
where we have, for example, seen in countries like Germany and Portugal and Sweden, food inflation up at around 20%. It's a bit over 14% in our country, but it's still high. So we're certainly looking at that. Where we see supernormal profits due to big external shocks like rise, raises in the uh, energy prices, that we've gone in and we've had windfall taxes, which we've used in the case of energy companies, to make sure that we have halved the average uh, energy bill. So could for windfall taxes over the be last used year. in sectors so, outside of the energy sector then? Then, well, I, I, I'm not going to speculate as to on taxation policy. That's a matter for the Chancellor. But I think uh, to your point about excessive profits, where we saw it within the energy sector, we stepped in decisively. We did apply additional taxes in that particular case, windfall taxes, which we then used to lower people's fuel bills, energy bills, and I think that that was the right thing to do. And potentially, could be the right thing. I know you don't want to speculate, you've been very, very well behaved uh, on, on, the, on the interview. Um, but, but do you have concerns about excess profits in other sectors other than energy? Well, as I say, I think the Competition and Markets Authority are in discussions with the Chancellor. It is something that the Bank of England and others are looking at. What government can't, and in my opinion shouldn't be doing, is attempting to, from the Ministry at the centre, try and control pricing across the whole of the economy. That's just not realistic. The important thing is you rely generally on competition to make sure that margins are at sensible levels. But as I say, particularly in the case of retail and food, the Chancellor has been working and liaising very closely with the Competition and Markets Authority. There is an ongoing investigation going on at the moment. They're looking closely at that, and I think that's the right approach. And um, we've been talking about the cost of living and how mm. difficult it is for people, and I guess there is nowhere where that is more acute than childcare. Like, it takes a huge proportion mm. Mm. Uh, of people's monthly incomes. Yeah. What are you doing? So, from today, we have increased very substantially, in fact, by 47%, the maximum amount that those on universal credit can claim against their childcare. So a huge increase in the amount of support that's going in there. The second thing we've done is one of the barriers to people taking on childcare has been they've had to find the money up front for that first month, and we're providing financial assistance to take that problem away. But you mentioned the cost of living, Sophie, and you're right to do so. My department's been right at the centre of getting out those cost of living payments to 8 million low-income households, £900, £150 to 6 million disabled people, £300 in December to uh, those who are uh, pensioners. We mentioned the energy price guarantee, keeping those energy costs down. I put up uh, the benefits uh, generally by 10.1%, pensions went up by 10.1%, the national living wage for the low paid by 9.7%. Wherever we can target those who are most vulnerable and most in need, that is where we're providing that vital support. Um, now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the race to be London there, and I'm sure this won't come mm. as any surprise to you. Mm. Um, Daniel Korski, now he, of course, is one of the final three in the running to be the Conservative candidate mm. to be London Mayor. He's been accused of groping somebody, of touching their breast. Mm. He denies it. Should he withdraw? Well, it, it's not for me, I think, to opine on that. I've read what I've read in the papers. I don't know the background mm. to the situation. Uh, I know that a, a complaint has been made. Uh, but what I do know is where complaints have been made, they will be looked into very thoroughly. Mm. Uh, he, of course, has vigorously denied uh, the allegations that have been made. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know the, the realities of that situation. How important is it for this complaint to be investigated quickly? I think any serious complaint of that nature clearly needs to be looked at Who should investigate carefully. it? Well, th 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 this it would be determined by, I think, the nature of the complaint. And if I can talk in generalities... We uh, know what the complaint um, is, right? Well, what the allegation is. Well, I, I personally, Something. you may know more than me. Well, I, I don't know the full. I don't the... know the full details, and and you do need to look into complaints in details to determine, for example, whether it's a matter for the police or it's not a matter for the police. And I'm not sitting here today in your studio knowing the answer to that. So I think the important thing is that to know that it will be looked into who's appropriately. Who's, where, a, where a formal, who's where a formal look complaint into it, is. I get, you know, this well, guy's he's in the running to it, be it, the it, London it, Mayor. It feels like it, it, it depends. It, it depends needs... on it, right. So where there's a formal complaint that's made, um, mm. it could be anybody that's made a formal complaint about anybody else in that that kind of situation. It's then down to the judgments of those where the complaint has been made as to where that goes on to. Now, does it, it does it become something that the police should be looking at? Is it something that's an internal process within a political party and so on? But what I'm saying is I'm not in a position 
and probably you aren't either with great respect, to be able to determine who exactly should be looking into a sure. complaint of that nature. Absolutely, given that we but that's don't why I'm asking yeah. you who the complaint would be... I mean, the, to be completely honest, the reason I'm asking this is because the woman who's made this allegation says that it wasn't actually that easy to raise a complaint. Yes. And those around Daniel Korski were saying, well, there no complaints being made. She's like, OK, then I will try and make a complaint. Yes. And, and, and I'm just... I don't know who's going to look into that. Well... I'm not saying that I should decide who looks well, into it, but I'm saying that I it, guess it, maybe it, people would have a bit more confidence in the process that you say should be followed if we knew what that process was. So I, I think in any situation where there is a complainant uh, involving something that is serious, mm -hmm. in the first instance, it, it really depends on exactly what the nature of that complaint is as to where they go. So in this case, there is a political dimension to it, so um, okay. I, I believe there is a complaint to government. Mm -hmm. But as to where it finally gets investigated, is if that is okay. what is appropriate, then I think it does depend on the precise nature and the details of exactly what happened okay. or is alleged to have happened. And I don't feel in a position to sit here and say, Sophie, this is how it should happen, this is who should investigate it, or these should be the consequences. Sure, well. sure. I'm not asking you to decide, I just wondered yeah. who would... No, no, or exactly how it should proceed. Who are you supporting rather. in the race to be uh, London Mayor? I haven't decided. I, I want to see, you know, who... Um, I want to see a bit more of them, um, but uh, I've, I've not decided at this stage. And um, Claire Catino said today that sh her support for Daniel Korski is on pause right now. Well, as I say, I, I, I haven't made a decision as to who I would like to see in that position. OK. Uh, there's one more thing that I do want to get your uh, view on yeah. uh, as well. Uh, this happened uh, at the Ashes earlier today. Johnny Birthday there, uh, England cricketer... Yes. ..carrying off a Just Stop Oil protester. What, what do you make of this? Do you think it's fair enough that people want to, you know, make a protest in a non-violent way? Yeah, I, I believe, believe in a free society in which people's voice, voices should be heard, and I believe in protest. I don't believe in that. And um, I don't believe in people going to the Chelsea Flower Show and throwing things around. I don't pe believe in people sitting in the road and holding up the traffic and stopping ambulances and inconveniencing the general public. Do you public. think the police I think should it's the take the, the Johnny Bester approach of uh, carrying them? Well, we, we've them given off. them the tools to be fairly robust in those situations. And I think, generally speaking, the police should be fairly robust. Um, and I don't think it helps their cause. I think that's the irony of all this. I think most people look at that and just think that it's the wrong way to go about protesting. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, of course, since that interview, uh, Daniel Korski pulled out of the race, which meant Mel Stride didn't have to comment on it. But we weren't going to let him get away with that, were we? Because after we heard the news about the uh, pulling out of the race, our producer, Izzy Lossoff, put on her best running shoes. She managed to get a camera in front of him out on the street by the studio here as he was leaving, and this is what he said. I think probably the, the political pressure here is such that he's probably taken the right decision. But it's not for me to opine as to whether the allegations are right or wrong. I know he denies them. Um, but I think probably the political pressure made that the right thing. And as he said in his statement, I think the pressure that it's putting on his family. At Mel Stry there. Well, we are going to talk more about Daniel Korski on the programme uh, later on. Um, but I just want to get a bit of reaction to, I guess, some bigger picture stuff with uh, Sam, our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates, who's with us now. There's an awful lot of pressure going on with cost of living. There's an awful lot of scrutiny going on about how much government should intervene in markets, in companies to help people. And now, of course, we have this Thames Water story, first broken by our city editor, Mark Kleinman. I mean, it does really feel like something is going on in politics right now. That's right. You know, it might, it might seem like there are just a lot of disparate things going on, but, but there is a big theme that links them at the moment, which is whether you're looking at the government's attempts to bring down prices, whether you're looking at the government talking to the regulator about whether or not to bring Thames Water back into national ownership temporarily to keep it together, to keep it, keep it functioning. You're having to watch Conservative struggle with, as it were, what you always thought conservative ideology was. And it was really interesting listening to Mel Stride in that interview because you were effectively asking him about the limits 
of the free market and where the state should intervene, whether it's on energy prices, whether it's on uh, the water system, whether it's on uh, prices all around. Today, Jeremy Hunt had a meeting with five regulators. He claimed that he'd got an action plan off the back of that in order to bring down prices in all sorts of areas, ensure that banks pass on savings through interest rates to uh, their customers, uh, persuade petrol pet stations uh, to bring down costs as the international oil price comes down. But in the end, what's going on at the moment is markets aren't able to regulate themselves and conservatives are having to find whether or not they need to intervene heavily. They're finding that difficult. Yeah, I, I got that sense from Mel Stride too. You can tell that he is someone who believes in free markets, right? He's a capitalist. And I, I just got the sense that he, he was so uncomfortable criticising business. But I guess if you are going to pull the thread that they seem to be suggesting we should, which is that, yes, there are excess profits being made, that certainly seems to be what the Chancellor's worried about, then there has to be some kind of control, right? And what's really striking is the language that they use. There's a, there's a bit of a cop-out going on. Mm. Today, ministers will confirm that they're involved in talks about nationalising Thames Water. They're uh, looking at, um, at various plans across various bits of the economy. But if you ask them in interviews, their default is to hide behind regulators. Mm -hmm. They're saying, talk to Ofwat, talk to the Competition and Markets Authority, talk to uh, the Financial Conduct Authority. They're, they're the people that do the dirty business of intervening in markets. And we set some principles. But no, right now, the Tories are discovering, for political reasons, the limit to the free market, having to recalibrate the kind of grand vision speeches that they spent 20 years going on about and, and actually work, rework out for themselves where sensible limits to free markets should lie. And it's not where they told us it was. That's really interesting, Sam. A big a kind of philosophy philosophical questions uh, tonight. Uh, we'll have more from Sam later in the programme. We'll also hear from Labour as well. Their position is quite interesting, I think, in the wider context of what me and Sam were talking about too. Under Jeremy Corbyn, you knew that that was an opposition very happy to talk about intervening in markets. What about Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet? We'll find out uh, after the break, live here in Westminster. Uh, about his position on Thames Water. Hello, welcome back to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Surge in rivers and on beaches, worries about the cost of water and profits made by firms. And now the country's biggest water company supplying fully a quarter of the population, Thames Water, is on the brink of collapse. Well, no better Labour frontbencher to talk to us this evening than the Shadow Environment Secretary. This is Jim McMahon. Lots of concern over the future of Thames Water. How worried should we be? Well, I think it is a worry. You know, the largest water company in Britain, it's got debts of £14 billion that are built up. Uh, it's got millions of people who rely on it for its clean water, for, dis for dealing with the, uh, the sewage. And, you know, rightly, people are concerned about what that means in particular if it requires a government-led bailout that's then ultimately added to the bill payers. And so we've been holding the government to account. We brought to, uh, today an urgent question to Parliament. The Secretary of State it didn't even bother to turn up to answer the question. And so, you know, for me, it does raise kind of real concerns about whether the government have got a grip on this or whether they've been taken by complete surprise because they haven't organised well enough. So what needs to happen then? What should happen? Well, the question for the government really is, is this the canary in the coal mine? Is this really speaking to a wider vulnerability in our water industry, where £72 billion has been taken out in shareholder dividends? We haven't seen money invested to reduce leaks and sewage discharges. But and what, in the what end... What should happen, though? That's the question. What Right now, Thames Water... Lots of people would be very worried. If you were in government, what would you do? Well, at this point, the regulator uh, has the power to have a court order to essentially take control of the water company to make sure they continue to trade and service uh, its customers. And we understand those talks are taking place today. Uh, if we were in government, well, you would expect me to say we wouldn't be here in the first place because we are not surprised by this. You know, we've had the warnings of financial vulnerability from Ofwat themselves, who have said all but two of the water companies in England and Wales uh, are above the debt levels that they're comfortable with, that they agreed to in the last pi uh, price review. And it just strikes me that we haven't got the right balance here. We've allowed those shareholder dividends to go out on one hand, £72 billion. We've allowed debt now to reach levels of £60 billion that we're all paying for through our bills. And now we're requiring forward investment to deal with the water shortages where leaks are losing water and also sewage discharges where our rivers, lakes and seas are being completely disrespected with raw human sewage. Well, you've spelled out the problem, right? Yeah. Does that mean that Labour would 
bring the water companies back under government control? Would you nationalise them? Well, we said as a point of principle, so this is for the industry overall, taking to one side the issue immediately with Thames, which is, as a point of principle, why should working people pay twice? They've already paid through their bills for Sorry, water companies. Would Labour nationalise the water companies? We believe that the water companies that have taken £72 billion of shareholder dividends should be made to fix a system that's broken. Would Labour nationalise the water companies? Well, the answer to that is no, because the water companies have to put right the system that they've taken £72 billion I'll, I'll be for. honest, I think there'll be an awful lot of people listening to you thinking, I agree with you. These dividends are ridiculous. Look at this. £1.4 billion in dividends to yeah. the water companies last year. That's outrageous. Sewage in the rivers and the seas, that is outrageous as well. And, of course, now these financial vulnerabilities as well. Why won't you nationalise them? Well, at this point, why should bill payers, because that's who would pay the bill of nationalisation, why should bill payers pay water company shareholders who have already taken over £70 billion out of the system why should they pay them for an artificially because inflated share value today could, uh, to bring back into public better, ownership? The other better side service, of it, better water and cheap in the long term, I guess. But I think that's about regulation in the end. Uh, and we can require, instead of losing that £1.8 to £2 billion every single year in dividend payments as an average, we can direct the water companies to use that to fix a sewage scandal, to fix the leaks where we're having water shortages. That's got to be the first port of call before we go to nationalisation. Now, clearly, we have to deal with all eventualities. And if we have a system, uh, a water industry that has market failure, we're not seeing that on a systemic level yet, but we are concerned about Thames, then, of course, you need to look at that environment at that point in time. But that's not where we are today. What about the regulator off what? Has that failed? Well, it's pretty clear that the regulator has very big questions to answer. But in the end, the regulator will only ever be as strong as the government gives it direction to be strong and gives it the powers to be strong. And I observe, frankly, a Secretary of State and a Conservative government that haven't uh, given it the importance that's needed, haven't given it the strength of ambition that's needed, and haven't given them the powers that's needed to put this right. So absolutely they can do more, but it requires leadership from the Conservative government to really give them the direction. Um, now, The Times have just published a story in the last hour or so to say that Keir Starmer is planning to reshuffle his top team in the next month or so. I just want to read a quote to you from the piece. Um, the quote is, Jim McMahon is likely to be demoted from Shadow Environment Secretary with Labour determined to do more about water cleanliness. Doesn't sound great for you? Uh, well, I mean, listen, first of all, that's speculation. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work that I've done in the Environment Brief. You know, the way that we have really brought now to the public's attention what's really been going on you in our to keep water job here, <laughs> industry. Hoping I, that Keir Starmer I, might be listening. That I, I'm pretty confident that I've done a good job on water, that I've done a good job on access uh, to nature, that we've done a good, good job on food security. Now, clearly, I'm not going to speculate about a future reshuffle, but I can say in terms of my record in the post that I'm very proud of what I've done. And I would just say this, how many people had it in their consciousness that raw human sewage was being dumped in their rivers, their lakes and their seas. Of course, because of the campaigners, but also because of the weight that Labour has given from the front bench, and I've led from the front uh, on that in a way that I'm very proud of, because I believe in the end it comes down to what does it mean to div live a decent, fulfilled life as a working person, and having quality of life is really important to that. So, uh, speculating to one side, I'm very proud of what I do in this job. I mean, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, but it sounds a little bit like you're trying... You're almost acknowledging that you are likely to lose your job and you're just trying to pitch for on your record. Well, no, I, well I'm not, for a start, and I'm not going to get into the speculation and the motivations uh, behind it. Uh, but listen, the environment brief is a coveted brief, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if more people were looking at it and saying, with the profile that we've raised uh, in terms of food security, in terms of the water industry, in terms of nature and all that has to offer, of course, I would expect other people So your uh, rivals to want are coming it. from you, maybe. Uh, maybe but, they're who briefed to, to but, but, challenge, but, but, you think. But, but I'm very proud of the work uh, that, that I've done. Uh, and I do think that is seen by others. OK. Um, are you a cricket fan? Uh, not particularly, no. What did you make of the... <laughs> I, don't uh... think I, I just batted that one away, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Um, what did you make of the uh, Just Up Oil uh, protesters uh, interrupting the ashes? Well, I mean, I think, as a general rule, if we want everyday people to believe that the climate crisis is something that they have to make a contribution to individually and collectively. We've got to bring people with us. Uh, and I think any measures that really set the general public against the argument isn't helpful. So I can understand why they feel the need to do it, because it gets attention and we're talking about it today. But I definitely don't believe that's the way to win the hearts and minds of the general public. OK, thank you very much. Thank you.
Jim McMahon uh, there. I do wonder what went through his mind when he saw that Times story break just before our interview, saying he was going to be demoted in a reshuffle in the next month. Uh, maybe a quick uh, hasty call to his advisor to work out the line on that one. Interesting stuff, though, of course, as well uh, from Labour uh, on whether or not the water company should be nationalised. Difficult issue uh, for them as well. You're watching The Take. We are live in Westminster. Up next, we are going to be taking a closer look at those allegations around one of the former candidates to be London Mayor for the Conservatives, Daniel Corsi. Hello, welcome to Westminster. You're watching The Take this evening. Well, we've been discussing throughout the programme, Daniel Korski, one of the three in the race to be the Conservative candidate for Mayor of London, has dramatically dropped out of the contest. And this is all about an allegation that was made against him by novelist and TV producer Daisy Goodwin that he touched her breast in 2013. Uh, this is what we had to say a little bit earlier this evening. He said, I categorically deny the allegation against me. Nothing was ever put to me formally 10 years ago, nor seven years ago when the allegation was alluded to. No investigation has ever taken place. I've been clear I would welcome and constructively participate in any investigation. However, the pressure on my family because of this false and unproven allegation and the inability to get a hearing from my message of the London dream makes it impossible for my campaign to carry on. Well, I want to talk to our political correspondent, Liz Bates, who joins us now. Liz, really, no one better to talk to you, talk to you than you this evening, because you've done a lot looking into how complaints are looked at in Westminster, about the culture in Westminster, uh, whether victims and alleged victims are able to get their voices heard. Mm. What has this allegation and the way it's been dealt with? What's your takeaway on it? What has happened in the last couple of days with Daniel Korski? I think has shone a light on the problem in Westminster, the difference between the processes that are in place, the codes of conduct, uh, the various bodies that you can go to to make complaints, and culture within Westminster. And sometimes there is a huge gulf between those two things. Now, what's been quite interesting in particular um, with Daniel Korski, I think, is that uh, when this allegation emerged, what we were told again and again by the Conservative Party and Number 10, um, who both have a level of responsibility to in some way deal with this, was that the, process were in, the processes were in place. What has become increasingly clear, I think, to me over the last 24 or 48 hours is there really are no processes in place to deal with this. There was never, in the end, a proper investigation launched. And what happened was both of those institutions stepped back mm hoped that it would resolve itself and in the end it did but in a way that how can this be a good resolution for victims in future who feel that they have to go to the press to get anything done or people who are accused mm -hmm. who Daniel Korski has now dropped out without any investigation purely because of the political pressure that surrounded him. It does feel a bit crazy doesn't it and I was quite struck by the interview that I did with Mel Stride because I kept asking who's going to investigate and he was like no it's not up to me to decide that and you shouldn't be deciding that either but I guess I was asking because if there is a process surely you should be able to say who's going to look at it even if we don't know the outcome. Yes and I thought that again, uh, that's the question that I've been asking this week to number 10, to the Conservative Party. Who is, party. Who is actually looking into it? Nobody is looking into it. That, in the end, uh, is the problem. And the reason is because nobody wanted to look into it. Nobody felt that they wanted to step up and take responsibility. And I think the interesting thing about this as well is, you know, you look back, the Conservative Party already knew of this allegation and had already chosen to do nothing. And I thought, Mel Stride's view on it really encapsulated how Conservative MPs feel, how the party feel, how many institutions in Westminster feel. They don't want to deal with it. They want it to sort itself out on its own. And you saw Mel Stride there saying, well, maybe it was the right thing to do to step down. And what he meant was, that's the best thing for me, for the party, for our future, but not for the people involved who have really been through the ring of both of them. Really interesting, Liz. Great to talk. Uh, thank you very much for giving us uh, your take. Uh, now, uh, we are rattling on uh, in the programme. If you are an MP looking a bit nervously at the next election, which I think quite a lot of them will be, you might be concerned about the boundaries of your constituency, what it means for your chances. 
our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. He's keen to talk a little bit more about the all-important constituency boundary. Sam, why should we care about this? So it's not that you'll be reading the enormous amounts of documentation published today on the Boundary Commission website. It's because... What do you mean? <laughs> Surely our viewers are going to be absolutely all over the internet checking that out. What's going on? is that many, many constituency boundaries are being redrawn in order to make sure that some of them don't get too big. 77,000 is going to be the ceiling, really, of how big a constituency is going to be in the next parliament. And that requires some redrawing, some reallocation. So, it's, in essence, there are going to be fewer seats in Wales, more seats in England. But the reason this is interesting is that, all of a sudden, MPs thought that the area they thought they represent, in some cases, doesn't exist anymore, or they have to fight for a new seat to represent. And I think this is going to be the beginning of something quite difficult in politics. If you just uh, pull up uh, what we've got here, um, you've got some um, MPs poring over maps like this one. Now, this is North West Durham uh, showing uh, the constituency of one uh, Rick Holden, who is a high-flying minister, one of the few 2019 Red Wallers actually to be in Rishi Sunak's government. Every reason to think uh, that he's got a bright political future in front of him, apart from this. I hope we can read his statement which comes after the, all the detailed maps on his wall that he's taken a picture of. Uh, but if we go on to the next slide, we can see uh, this, which is an extraordinary statement from him saying that he is now absolutely deeply disappointed and frankly devastated that the Boundary Commission today uh, has decided that they're getting rid of his seat. And it doesn't look like he, at the moment, knows where he's going to stand or even if he's going to stand. Now, he's not fully decided to standing down, but he doesn't look like he's got a political future. Now, that ties in, that kind of uncertainty for MPs, I think is going to mean more people announcing they're standing down. Today we had the 66th MP announcing that they're standing down. That was Stuart Hosey, veteran SNP. We've got more than one mm. in 10 MP saying that they're standing down. And quite a lot of them, five of them, were first elected in 2019. I mean, that is extraordinary, isn't it? Um, hasn't, they haven't really left very long, have they, if they uh, decide to go just a few years after first being elected? Bad news for the Conservatives, I guess, as well. Uh, the stats are, are stark. 41 Tories are standing down, 14 Labour. Uh, and of those, 25 of the Tories were elected in 2010 or later. They're going in quite large numbers. We're going to see a very different uh, Parliament after the next election, whatever happens. You are watching The Take, live in Westminster. Next up, we're going to be talking about Ukraine. Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Now, it's been an extraordinary last few days in Russia. That attempted rebellion on Saturday and then the rumours and the claims that have followed all as President Putin tries to reassert his diminished authority. Well, meanwhile, in Ukraine, the war grinds on, with the Ukrainian counteroffensive seemingly getting into its stride. President Zelensky says that progress is being made, and British military intelligence assessments earlier this week said the Ukrainians had likely taken ground held by Russia since 2014, the first time that's happened. While well, Canada is a key part of the Western Alliance, supplying arms and other aid to Ukraine, the country's Defence Minister, Anita Anand, is in the UK meeting our Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace. I spoke to her a little earlier. You've been here in the UK today talking about Ukraine. Um, what's been discussed? The continuing need for us to support Ukraine in the short and the long term as it fights back the Russians. We've seen Ukraine make gains in the north and the east and the south. And we, as a group of countries around the NATO table, will continue to be there to support Ukraine. It's about Ukraine's sovereignty, but also the rules-based international order that has kept us all safe since the end of the Second World War. Do you think that Ukraine can actually win the war? Most definitely. The resolve of the Ukrainian people is evident. Putin thought he would take Kyiv in days, and he thought that Europe would freeze in the dark. He thought that the NATO table would fracture. All of those things have not come to pass. Ukraine is continuing to show that it has the will and the ability to win this unjust and illegal war. We had the extraordinary week that we saw in Russia uh, with the attempted rebellion uh, by the head of the Wagner Group. Has that made any difference, do you think, to the war? I told my team that we need to continue to focus on the purpose of Western and indeed Canadian 
aid, and that is to help Ukraine fight and win this war. Canada has already donated over $1 billion of military aid and over $8 billion of economic, financial and military aid overall. And that's our purpose, focusing on how we can help Ukraine. We have a very large Ukrainian diaspora in Canada, and we are 100% with Ukraine so that it can win this war. You say you're 100% with uh, Ukraine. How committed is Canada to NATO? Canada is a founding member of NATO. And we have been a strong partner around the table. We lead the Enhanced Forward Presence Battle Group in Latvia, for example, and have done so for over five years. Uh, so we are very strong and continuing contributing partner to NATO with boots on the ground. I, I guess one of the reasons that I'm asking uh, is because NATO recently held its largest ever combat exercise over Germany. Canada didn't go. Are you committed to NATO or are you really prepared for other people, I guess, to do your dirty work for you? Not at all. We have participated in numerous NATO exercises. We recently signed a contract with Lockheed Martin to purchase 88 F-35s, and we are in a period of growth in our Royal Canadian Air Force, and we are continuing to undertake that growth while participating in exercises wherever we can. Um, you spent the day... Uh, with Ben Wallace, the UK uh, Defence uh, Secretary today. He was hoping to get a new job, head of NATO. Would you, would you like to see that? Ben has been an incredible collaborator and partner a lot around the NATO table, as well as with the Defence Contact Group. I enjoy working with him immensely and will continue to do so. So would you have made a good NATO head then? Ben's an incredible leader, and uh, I know that he is very capable at whatever he does. Um, I'm just keen to ask you a bit of a big picture question now, because, you know, it's great to have you here. We don't always get the chance to speak to representatives from other countries in yeah. this way. Mm -hmm. um, we've been talking about Russia and Ukraine, but there are clearly other global threats that people have their eye on. For you, what would you say is the biggest global threat right now? I think that it is a mistake for us to focus on one conflict zone alone. And indeed, Putin would like nothing more than to see us all focus 100% on one country, the country that he illegally invaded. No, for us, we take a step back and we say that the global threat environment has changed overall. Canada recently released, for example, its Indo-Pacific strategy. We are committing as a Pacific country to increase our presence in the Indo-Pacific, to add a third frigate, to engage in exercises with our partners, to increase our presence in the area of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. This is just an example of how Canada won't just focus on one global conflict zone. We will take a broad-based approach to ensure that we are fulfilling our our obligations, upholding international law as well as international norms. It's interesting you're talking about cybersecurity. A lot of people talk about artificial intelligence as being a way that it's transforming our world. Is that something that you've got your eye on as well? Canada is a leader in the artificial intelligence space, in the area of quantum technologies and innovation writ large. And we certainly do have our eye on that in furthering our relationships with our partners, offering our expertise. Certainly in the Five Eyes context, we will continue to collaborate with our partners in that alliance, as well as around the NATO and NORAD tables. And one very different subject that I want to ask you about, because I know that it's something that many of our viewers have been following uh, very closely, which is the fate of the Ocean Gate submarine, uh, where people tra tragically lost their lives when they were going to try and view the Titanic. Now, Canadian authorities have been investigating. Is there any update you can give us on that? Well, first and foremost, I'd like to extend my deepest condolences to the families who lost loved ones. Uh, in that incident, uh, my heart really goes out to them. In terms of Canada, uh, we have an investigation that is ongoing, that is being conducted by Transport Canada. And right from the very beginning of the search, we had deployed an aircraft as well as a Navy vessel 
to ensure that Canada was doing whatever it could together with the United States and others to assist in the time of need. Uh, but of course, that investigation is ongoing. Of course, the investigation goes on. Um, how important is it to try and get to the bottom of what happened, I guess, to either find out if there is anyone or anything to blame and also to stop it happening again? Of course, as the investigation proceeds, it would be premature for me to make those types of comments or hypotheses. Uh, but I will say that Canada, from a domestic standpoint, will always be there to assist when others have needs, mm -hmm. whether it is domestically as we fight forest fires at home, or whether it is internationally in collaborating with our allies in the evacuation of Sudan or anywhere else. And that's exactly what we're seeing uh, around the aid for Ukraine. And one of the things I'm going to be doing uh, tomorrow is visiting Camp Lid, where Canadian Armed Forces members, together with other countries, including the UK, are training Ukrainian new recruits. That's the type of collaboration that Canada will bring to the table, regardless of the issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my interview there with Canada's Defence Minister, Anita Anand, uh, on the show a little earlier. Well, busy, quite varied uh, programme, everything from the race to be the Conservative candidate for London Mayor that I have to say now is looking pretty tough uh, for the Conservative Party. Uh, and of course, uh, the cost of living crisis that won't go away. In the spotlight right now, the water companies. That's the issue. The problem though, and the solution to the problem, still feels uh, a little bit far away. That's it for The Take this week. We'll be back next week on Wednesday. Up next, it is Sky News at 10. Thanks for watching.